only having beliefs, but having beliefs about other people's beliefs. This is considered, for example, being considerate in a social situation. It's also, of course, very useful in a competitive interaction. I'm, we're flying up to Indiana tomorrow to, to probably buy a house. And so they know things and we know things, and the question is, is what do they know about us and what do we know about them? Uh, Dear Oprah is still here, so I learned from David, I think this is right, David, you tell me, that the, you know, on average, you get to about there before people tap out, right? The number of levels you go, is this two something? No, one and a half or so. One, 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 one and a half. So we're actually, I'm sorry, I overestimated us here. We're sort of one and a half. So we could do this, I know something. And I know, okay, you know, I know the jury knows something, but when you start asking me to make, to, to reason on the basis of the fact that he knows and I know that he knows something, I start to tap out. One of the people that you might associate most with theory of mind, which makes this book so profoundly hard to read, is Henry James, who in his novel sets up enormous numbers of problems, and you might remember from Wings of the Dove, this question of, well, she knows that I know that she knows something. And in fact, if you parse out some of these passages, certainly from the later Henry James, you can see he probably goes, I don't know, and I have to talk to David about this, because it'd be fun to write a serious article on it, how many levels deep does Henry James actually go? I think he goes at least three levels deep, so much more than your average stockbroker. <laughs> we have uh, a mathematical formalism of this. This is Alman, who developed interactive epistemology. And again, I know Dear Roper is the expert on a lot of this material, and a lot of this just from hanging around him. But he sort of formalized these kinds of problems, not just of knowledge about the world, but knowledge about other people's knowledge. So, just to be clear, a good big theory, right, for your big data, should be able to ascribe probability statements, and if you read things that don't remember this problem. What is the probability that Millie believes, that Kate believes, that Burton loves Millie? Okay. That's a crucial plot point in The Wings of the Dove. And if your machine is good enough, it should be able to ascribe a probability to that, or at least it should be able to ascribe a probability to that. All right, so here's the Goodellian move, okay? Assign a non-zero non probability to the following, okay? And I'll, if you want, email me, and I'll email you this sentence. A little tricky, but it works. Okay. Millie believes that Kate believes that quote Kate believes that Millie's belief is wrong. Okay. So let's say there's a probability of that being true. What is the probability of the following sentence? Millie believes that Kate's belief is wrong. What you can see is we've set up a little paradox here. Okay. So that if Millie believes that Kate's belief is wrong, then this is not true. Right. Okay? And if she believes the opposite, it is true. Okay? So what we've done is we've derived a contradiction. What we've shown in some sense is that it's impossible to build a formal system that can reason completely and accurately about sentences of this form here. Okay? So, right, oh no, right, danger, danger, Will Robinson. So, um, Gerdelian's thing was, actually, this is, this is, you know, certainly this kind of sentence is something you might want to model. So, Okay, instead of making it about, about love and betrayal, we can make it about you know, money. So, you know, uh, Rentech believes that Goldman Sachs believes that Rentech has a new algorithm, or a better algorithm, those kinds of problems. And in order to describe the stock market, you're probably going to want to be able to attribute probabilities to those kinds of statements. Okay? But what we've shown here is that any kind of formal system that does that will indeed fall in. Like David is thinking really hard. I'm watching him thinking about this. I don't think he's seen this before. So, a. a uh, Building a machine that can derive these, you essentially derive a contradiction. So what you realize is there have to be holes somewhere in there. Now, we have holes all the time in human reasoning, but human reasoning is much more flexible. We're allowed to revise our axioms, we don't fix them ahead of time. We're allowed, to also, we're allowed, for example, to be wrong. We're allowed to say, yeah, that's a statement that you could derive. So one way out of this is just saying, you know what, these are just not really relevant. Don't even ask questions about this many levels of people. So we're, we have more flexibility. We can't really program that flexibility into machines because kind of flexibility we give ourselves is a response to the kinds of needs we have as human beings, the kinds of things we want to model. And so until you can give a computer an idea about what we want, you probably can't give a computer the ability to solve all of these problems on our behalf. So let me put up a, uh, just a little sort of summary slide here, and there's the Arduino. So I, I told you a little story um, about a dinner we had at Harvard, and where I learned how many thousands of books or texts you were allowed to read before you tap down. Uh, I gave the example of Chris Moore um, committing a crime, or in this case, intervening at the end of a crime. And we talked about the difference between these kinds of data and these kinds of data. 
I gave you kind of a ghost from Christmas Future story about what happens if the big data problem ever truly hits the hard sciences. Okay, will sort of look like humanities departments looked like in the 1980s, right? Where we became increasingly fragmented, we became increasingly interested in smaller and smaller problems, we became increasingly unable to bridge the gap, not only between disciplines, but even within our own disciplines. I think actually uh, one of the reasons that archaeology has been able to keep an eye on some of the really big questions we have is because they had so much fewer amounts of data. Now, that's a bit of a tease, but in a certain extent, given that there are 10,000, at least 10,000 texts in the Old Bailey over a 10-year period, you can see how being a historian of the modern era, you're going to get bogged down much more quickly. You're going to try to avoid making larger statements much earlier in your career. Um, we talked about Galileo, this idea of mathematization as being the alpha from the big data problem. I talked about the Reverend Mays as a sort of metonym for this idea of modeling human reason by ideal reason. We talked about the hybrid chimera historian physicist. I showed off a little bit, just a fun result we had. And then yes, Danger Grove Robinson, because some of these theories might be too hard, or we might even be dealing with a problem that we can't legitimately ask a computer to do, in part because it's wrapped up in some of our own needs and desires as humans. Until, in some sense, until we can make a computer that we can be friends with, we can't make a computer that can think for us. So.